Hey, it's Brian, back for the fourth and final installment of this Burr Month's bonus special Storytime miniseries, where Ricky Meese from the Sleigh Bells and Mistletoe Christmas podcast narrates the 1916 story When the Yule Log Burns by Leona Dalrymple. If you're listening in real time, this miniseries is being released on four consecutive days starting on Thursday, December 12th. And you really do need to listen from the beginning to follow along. And also, you really do need to subscribe to Sleigh Bells and Mistletoe for more Christmas fun for this season and beyond. In this final installment, we pick up from yesterday when it was Christmas Eve. It's now Christmas Day, and we follow all the goings-on at the home of John and Ellen from dawn to dusk. Before we get to it, I'd like to thank Ricky Meese once again for lending her talent, her lovely voice, and her Christmas spirit to all of us in the Christmas Past family. I have a feeling I'll be returning to this story year after year to get into the Christmas spirit, and maybe you will too. The next time we meet again, we'll be back to business as usual, exploring the backstories to favorite Christmas traditions and sharing your Christmas memories. But until then, let's pay one more visit to that Christmas in the country at the home of John and Mary. So get cozy and comfy and get into the Christmas spirit as we once again go back to 1916 for an old-fashioned country Christmas. Here now is Ricky Meese with the fourth and final installment of As the Yule Log Burns by Leona Dalrymple. The Log at Dawn In the still, cold corridors of a farmhouse, with frost jungles clouding every window pane and a zero dark outside, the cry of Merry Christmas is most at home. Let noses be ever so cold and blanketed bodies ever so warm. The cry fills the dawn with electric energy. The doctor began it. He knew by the instant response that he had started something that he could not stop. Almost in no time, it seemed, Roger was leading a wild, barefooted scamper down the stairs, for Roger knew, and the doctor, hastily bathrobed and slippered, was on behind with a lamp. But here was no cyclonic invasion of a dark, cold sitting room. Old Annie and Asher knew boys. A log blazed brightly in the fireplace, and the lamp was lit. If the room was overwarm, it proved simply that Annie had seen boys of another generation rushing down of a Christmas morning scantily clad. And the king of Christmas trees blazed in candle glory from wall to wall, tinseled boughs sagging with the weight of its Christmas freight. It could not have been bigger. It could not have glittered more. It had as many arms as an octopus, and its shaggy evergreen head, starred gorgeously with iridescence, brushed the old-fashioned paper on the ceiling. A great lovable Christmas giant guarding a cargo of gifts. Muggs emitted one blood-curdling shriek of delight, clapped his hand over his mouth, and began to swell about the cheeks. Then he stepped on the hem of his nightgown and fell sprawling at Annie's feet. Dear me, said Annie vexedly, though she righted him with kindly hands. I can't for the life of me make out what ails that child. He acts so mortal and queer at times, and he's ready to swell up over nothing at all. With the advent of Aunt Ellen, Christmas packages began to lose twine and paper, and what the packages lost, the sitting room speedily gained in disorder. For here were warm suits and overcoats, shoes and stockings and sweaters and caps, skates and horns and whistles and drums, homemade popcorn and candy, oranges, oh, the smell, sensible gifts in plenty, and foolish gifts that were wiser than Solomon, for they included a boy's heart as well as his body. In a lull, all eyes turned to mugs. His pockets were crammed with popcorn and candy. One arm was quite as full as toys as he could pack it. The other had begun the day's conveyance of food from hand to mouth. But he was regarding a very small, warm suit of clothes and substantial boots with dangerously quivering lips. For a moment, the startled doctor fancied he heard Mike hiss the astonishing words, Mom Murphy! But by the time he had wheeled about, Muggs, with circular eyes of terror, had begun to swell. That child, said Annie, has something on his mind. Don't tell me, I know it. 
The inevitable blare of racket came all too soon. Horns and whistles and drums united in a deafening blast. And if thanks did not come easily to the lips of boys, noise did. Nor could mugs at any time thereafter be separated from a shoulder drum, upon which he had beaten with insane and single-minded concentration even after the din was passed and a hungry hint of breakfast in the air. Lacking one outlet of expression, he had seized upon another. He drummed his way fiercely upstairs to dress, and he drummed his way back down to breakfast, a ridiculous self-consciousness in his small face whenever he glanced at his new suit of clothes. Small as it was, it engulfed him utterly. Jim, said the doctor suddenly, you're not limping. Jim hung his head and glanced at his shiny new shoes. No, sir, he said and gulped. Bless me, said the doctor, adjusting his spectacles. I thought you were lame, and if I hadn't forgotten it last night, you'd have no skates this morning. I didn't have no heel on one shoe, blurted Jim in confusion, and Roger, in relief, hurried himself into hoarseness. But Jim, like mugs, was something of a mystery, and after a time the doctor, with a sigh, abandoned his effort to break through the boy's sullen shyness. Still, Jim was the first at the chopping block when Annie wanted wood. And when the task took on something of the charm of Tom Sawyer's fence by reason of a winter wren, so tame from overfeeding that he perched himself now and then upon the handle of the axe, Jim fell back with resentment and resigned the axe to Marty Fay, who spat upon his hands, doubled up his fist, sparred, and in an excess of good spirits with an invisible antagonist, and thereafter made the chips fly so fast that the little wren departed. Already there were great Christmas bunches of oats upon glistening trees and fences, but while Asher was carrying double portions of food to cattle and horses, to Toby the cat, and Rover the dog, the doctor went about, with an eager pack of boys at his heels, distributing further Christmas largeness for his feathered friends, suet and crumbs and seed. For there were chickadees in the clump of red cedars by the barn, and jucos and nuthatches, white-throated sparrows and winter wrens, all so frank in their overtures to the doctor that the boys with one accord closed threateningly around mugs to keep him from drumming the birds into flight. Jim fastened a great chunk of suet to a tree trunk, and very soon a red-breasted bird was busy with his Christmas breakfast. Altogether, Roger's bang-up Christmas began with terrific bustle, with Annie, from whose kitchen already floated odors that set the insatiable mugs to sniffing, by far the busiest of them all. The grandfather's clock struck ten. It found the old farmhouse deserted, save for Annie in the kitchen and Aunt Ellen in her rocking chair by the sitting room window. The doctor was guiding his guest to the deacon's pond. New skates, new sweaters, and a pond as smooth as glass. What wonder, then, that Roger's trembling fingers bungled his straps, and Jim, kneeling, fastened them on with nimble fingers. Ain't you never skated? No, no, I, I've been lame. Oh, hurry, Jim. See, Mike's flying down that pond like wind. Jim's eyes softened. I'll teach you, he said. As for the doctor, he had disinterred an ancient pair of skates from the attic, and presently he began to perform pedal convolutions of such startling design and eccentricity that the boys gathered about him and cheered until, seating himself unexpectedly in the center of a particularly wide and airy flourish, he flatly told the boys to run about their business. Now Muggs, though he carried upon his shoulder a ridiculous pair of elfin skates, was much too small a boy, his brother thought, to embark upon the ice. Wherefore, he stood like a sentinel upon the shore and drummed and ate incessantly until an orange catapulted from an overcrowded pocket and then he pursued it with a roar. 
The peal of the village town clock striking 12 came all too soon, but homing was no task with a turkey at the end. Mugs, still wrapped in mysterious silence, knew the very spot where Christmas odors began to permeate the frosty air and redoubled the speed in his drumming arm. But when, after a vigorous scrubbing, his glistening eye fell upon the holly bright table and an enormous turkey by the doctor's plate. Only a frosty menace in Mike's eye, it seemed, restrained another blood-curdling shriek of delight. There was paralyzing apology in his eyes, and Mike's lips formed the soundless threat. Mom Murphy, he's holding himself in, said Annie. Mr. Muggs, give me that drum. You'll not crowd into the chair with that upon your shoulder. It seemed that Master Muggs would. He began to swell. He began to drum. He carried his point and crammed himself and his drum into his chair at the table. He did not speak. Neither from that time on did he permit any lapse in his industry. What Muggs did, from drum to drumsticks, he did very well. Muggs ate turkey and mashed turnips. Muggs ate potatoes, cranberry sauce, boiled onions, and quite a little celery. He glinted ahead at a pie on the sideboard, seemed to make hurried structural calculations, and pushed his plate again toward the turkey. Aunt Ellen looked at the doctor, and the doctor looked at Muggs. If that child eats any more, said Annie bluntly from the kitchen door, he must have a pill. "'Tis enough for him to drum away the peace of Christmas Day "'without stuffing himself that hard. "'Ye fear for his buttons. "'And to my mind, if he'd talk more and eat less, "'he'd not be in such danger of bursting.' "'Mike looked slightly agitated. "'Muggs,' said the doctor firmly, "'it comes to this. "'More turkey and one pill. "'No turkey, no pill. "'Muggs exhibited a capacity for instant decision.' With stubby forefinger rigid, he shoved his plate a little closer to the turkey. The Log at Twilight There was a straw ride in the farm sleigh after dinner, a story or two by the Yule Log when the twilight closed in, and Annie had lit the candles on the Christmas tree. And then as the boys were romping in a game of Rogers, the doctor slipped away to his study for a quiet hour with a book. His lamp was barely lighted and the book upon his knee when the door opened and Jim stood before him, his face so white and strained that the doctor laid aside his book, thinking instantly, of course, that here again was too much turkey. Jim hung his head, one toe digging into the carpet. Dr. John, he burst forth hoarsely. Yes. Jim gulped. I, I been in jail. The doctor looked once at Jim's face, quivering in an agony of shame, and hastily wiped his glasses. In the quiet came the laughter of romping boys. Why, said the doctor very gently. Why did you tell me? Something in the kindly voice opened the floodgates of a boy's sore heart. Jim's mouth quivered piteously. Then he broke down and hid his face behind his elbow, sobbing wildly. I want to be square, he said passionately. I want to be square like you've been to us. And, and Luke said, you might not want a jailbird here for Christmas. I, I stole coal for my mom. It was the old tale one boy caught paying for the petty thievery of the score who ran away. The doctor heard the mumbled tale to the end and cleared his throat. And so, he said slowly, you wanted to be square. That's the finest thing I've heard this Christmas day. Wanted to be square. Well, well. His hand was on Jim's shoulder now. Jim, I wonder if you could come back to me next Christmas and tell me you'd been absolutely straight. Here, said Jim in a choking whisper, his eyes blazing through his tears, again for Christmas? Somewhere on a snowy page, a Christmas angel wrote, One boy saved by the spirit of Christmas, a country Christmas. Here, 
Here, repeated the doctor, again, for Christmas. He opened the door. Now run along, Jim, run along, he said kindly, or the boys will miss you. Jim's final words were very gay. Dr. John, he blurted, I, I'm going to send poor little Muggs. The doctor was devoutly hoping that Muggs had never been in jail for stealing food or, or drums when Muggs himself appeared clinging desperately to the hand of Mike. He seemed on the verge of explosion. Mike's face was very red, but it was also very hopeful. She ain't never had no Christmas, and the minister, he said the order was all boys, and, and, and she cried, so Mom said, bring her anyway in my old suit. You never know, and, and, and oh my gosh, Muggs is a girl. Her name's Clara. The doctor jumped. So did Muggs. The explosion came, and the drum slipped down from the shoulder of Muggs with a clatter. Don't want to go home came the heartbroken wail. I don't want to go home. Mom Murphy will get me. I, I told her, explained Mike uncomfortably, that she mustn't open her mouth once. Just act deaf and dumb, or you'd guess that maybe she's a girl and send her home, and Mom Murphy would get her, and, and, and she must take a drum like a boy. Little Mugs. Heaven alone knew what other bloodthirsty threats had encompassed the stony silence and frenzied drumming of the little sister who had never had a Christmas. But why, burst the despairing doctor, in heaven's name, why, Muggs? She makes such awful faces, said Mike apologetically. Mom don't know what makes her do it that way. And then, as Muggs was at the climax of one of the spasms that had won her her name, the doctor suddenly lifted her in gentle arms and tossed her to the ceiling. Poor, poor little kitty, he said huskily. Poor, poor kitty. What a price she's paid for her Christmas. But Muggs had forgotten the price. Though it had been a hard day, the doctor's eyes were kind and twinkly. Muggs buried her flushed and tearful little face on his shoulder with a sigh of content and relief. He saw now that one knot of ribbon in those sunny curls would have told the story. Then he glanced at the bagging suit and opened the door. Muggs went forth upon the doctor's shoulder. Asher, cried the doctor, hitch old Polly to the sleigh and telephone San Rimson that he can oblige me for once and open his store. You ain't going to send her home, are you? faltered Mike. I'm going, cried the doctor, to buy Clara Muggs a dress and a doll. It's her night. And the boys all cheered. <laughs>